inviting me um, to talk this afternoon. Today, I want to consider the wider ecological implications of tree diseases and their impacts um, on the wider environment. So this graph shows the exponential increase in the cumulative total of new tree pests and pathogens since the 1900s. And each one of these pests or pathogens not only has the potential to have a significant impact on the health of one of our trees, but also to have a range of cascading effects. Most commonly discussed are the impacts of tree diseases on us as humans. So the impacts in terms of the goods we receive from the trees and the woodlands. More rarely discussed are the impacts on biodiversity and ecosystem functioning. And it's these impacts that much of my work has been focused on in recent years. In particular, staff at the James Hutton Institute and some colleagues at the Forest Research have focused on the impacts of a decline caused by ash dieback, Hymenocyphus fraxinus, and the impacts of a potential decline in oak that could be caused by acute oak decline or some of the other diseases affecting oak trees, such as the oak processionary moth. So for today, I want to have my talk in four parts that you can see here. And firstly, focus on identifying species that are associated with ash and oak trees. And although we know that trees host a wide range of biodiversity, until we did this work, we didn't actually have lists of what species occurred on what trees and therefore what might be at risk. So a species can use a tree in a variety of ways. It can directly eat the tree or it might eat other organisms that are found on that tree. So for example, birds eating invertebrates. A species could use a tree in terms of habitat. So the lichens and liverworts that are found on a tree or it could use a tree for nesting and breeding in, such as birds and bats. In addition, a tree will also influence the environment around it through shading, light and moisture. Um, and through those factors, it will then influence other woodland species indirectly. I'll briefly mention these impacts, but when I'm referring to an associated species, is these species that directly use the tree for food, nesting and habitat that I'm referring to. And it's not just how a species uses a tree that's important, but it's how tightly that um, association is. And I'll just take a while to explain some terminology. So when we're talking about an obligate species, I'm referring to a species that to the best of our knowledge, is only found on that particular host tree. If I'm talking about a highly associated species, then I'm talking about a species that largely uses that host, but will occasionally be found on other host trees. So in conjunction with um, a range of colleagues and other organizations that you can see listed here, we utilized uh, existing literature and databases to try to haul together to the best of our knowledge, um, a list of the species that are found on oak and ash trees. So we've put together our 955 ash associated species and um, over 2000 oak associated species. And actually it was perhaps the numbers found on ash trees that was most surprising. Um, ash trees are perhaps sometimes seen as almost the weed tree of the tree kingdom they're quite common um, and they're taken for granted almost. And it's not till ash dieback came along and they were at risk that we began to really realize their importance for supporting so much more of our wider biodiversity. In contrast, um, although we hadn't got a list of the oak associated species, oak had always had that reputation of being important and our numbers just show how important it is. When we looked at the level of association, we found that there were 45 obligate species on ash and 62 highly associated species. There was a far greater diversity on the oak tree with over 300 obligate species and over 200 
um, highly associated species. And it's these obligate and highly associated species that are potentially most at risk if either the ash or the oak trees decline in abundance. And many of these species um, already have some form of conservation protection. So for example, they're already in red data book lists um, because they're threatened by other, other drivers of change. But some of those species are not previously known to be at risk. And if we look down our lists, there are 67 of those ash species that are either obligate or highly associated and nearly 300 of the oak species that could now be at risk if ash or oak declined in abundance um, and were previously not considered as, as being at risk. So this really highlights how tree diseases can have a cascading effect, driving changes in our biodiversity. I'm briefly going to look at the impact of a change in ash and oak um, on the ground flora. And making this assessment is quite hard as it depends on the relative proportions of the different trees in the woodland. But very generally speaking, in an ash or oak dominated woodland, if the canopy of those tree species started to decline, we'd expect to see an increase in the light demanding species in the woodland ground flora as more light reached the floor. And this might be a similar effect to that which you'd see due to coppicing. In an ash woodland, in the longer term, we're probably likely to see a decline in the um, typical ash woodland ground flora species. As these species are quite light demanding because ash casts a very light shade. And any species that's likely to replace ash is likely to cast a far heavier shade. In an oak woodland, the impacts will probably be very dependent on what tree species replace our oak and the level of shading um, that, that it provides. So that all sounds a bit gloom and doom, but what can we do about it? Are there other tree species that we can use to replace oak and ash? And as an ecologist, when I'm thinking about the suitability of an alternative tree species, I'm thinking about its suitability in terms of the biodiversity it supports and how similar its functioning is. So in order to work out what species we wanted to consider as alternatives, we put together lists of the tree species that are already present in our ash and oak woodlands, as they're likely to fill the canopy gaps. And we also considered um, non-native tree species that will grow in the same climatic and soil conditions as ash and oak. When I'm talking about alternative tree species, I don't necessarily mean replanting. Um, it could mean that, but it could also mean encouraging natural regeneration of species that are already present within the woodlands. So we identified 48 other tree species to do an assessment for as replacements for ash and 30 alternative tree species for oak. So for each of our associated species, we try to find out whether they would or would not use each of the associated, each of the alternative tree species. So as you can see there, that's an awful lot of assessments, tens or hundreds, hundreds of thousands of assessments. This is the uh, results from the ash work and the graphs are quite complicated. So I'll talk you through it slowly. Along the bottom here, We've got our 48 alternative tree species and they're split in the first half into the native tree species and then secondly into the non-native tree species. Each bar represents the 955 ash associated species and the bar is split into three. The green part of the bar shows the number of species that we know will use that alternative. So in the case of oak here, 650 of the ash associated species will use oak. The black part shows the number of species that we know will not use that species. So here about 200 species that use ash will not use oak. 
and the white part shows the number of species for which we couldn't find information. So in terms of supporting our ash associated biodiversity, oak, elm and beech are the top three native species. When we look at the non-native species, sycamore is seen as the um, best alternative in terms of the number of species it supports. The other key thing to notice is the amount of white in these graphs for the non-native species. And this indicates that we couldn't find that information out and we just don't have the data to make a judgment about the suitability of many of these non-native tree species. This graph here shows the results for the oak work. It's laid out in the same way with our 30 alternative tree species along the bottom split into native and non-native. And there's a few key points to draw out from this graph in comparison to the ash. Firstly, there's far fewer generalizations that can be made for oak than for ash. So for ash, we had four alternative tree species um, that all supported more than 40% of the ash associated species. For oak, the best alternative only supports around 30% of the oak associated species. And there's only one species that's that good. The other thing that everybody immediately notices is that I've shown that oak is the best replacement for ash and ash is the best replacement for oak. And what happens if we lose both of them? And we'll come on to that later. Secondly, once again, there's a lot of missing data for the non-native species. Um, so we don't have the information we need to make an assessment. And sycamore is seen as a good non-native replacement or the best non-native replacement. You should be aware that for both of these graphs, I've just shown you the overall picture for all species. And obviously different tree species will provide greater or lesser support for different taxon groups. And what we really need is a much more site specific and species specific approach. And we'll come on to that later. So it's not only the similarity of a tree species in their biodiversity that we need to look at, but also their functioning. And to test the similarity of the functioning between different tree species, we utilize um, botanic gardens across the UK. And botanic gardens were a great resource for what we wanted to do, as within each botanic garden, the climate and the soils were very similar. And each garden had a wide range of tree species that we could sample. And we worked on the nine tree species listed here. Underneath each tree species, we looked at various uh, measures of functioning. So decomposition, soil temperature, and a range of soil characteristics listed there. We then did a principal components analysis of the data in order to construct an overall gradient of ecosystem functioning across these multiple variables. This is um, the simplified results from that principal components analysis. So this double headed arrow here is the first axis of the principal components analysis explaining most of the variation. At one end of this gradient, we've got our ash trees, which have got very fast decomposition and higher soil nitrogen levels. And at the other end, we've got beech and the non-native oaks with much slower decomposition and lower soil nitrogen. Firstly, you need to notice that common oak is at one end of this spectrum. And from this, we suggest that sorry, common ash, so replacing ash trees might be quite hard because it's at one end of this spectrum. There's no other tree species very close to it in terms of their functioning. In comparison, the native oaks are in the middle of this spectrum. And we suggest that maybe if you use the mixture of other tree species, on average, you might be able to replicate the functioning of our native oak species. You may remember from earlier on that native oaks were seen as a good replacement in terms of the, bio, the biodiversity they support for the common ash. They were quite similar. However, this results 
show that ash and oak are very different in terms of their functioning. So you really need to consider what measure you're using in terms of assessing the suitability of a replacement tree species to replace each other. Sycamore, you might remember, was seen as a potentially good replacement in terms of the biodiversity it supports for supporting um, the ash species. And its functioning to ash is also shown to be fairly similar. Although obviously there are other characteristics of sycamore, such as shading, that we didn't measure. I'd like to say that although we only looked at nine tree species here, We've also done a similar analysis using a far greater range of tree species um, and um, measures of ecosystem functioning from across the literature. And these large scale literature reviews have shown a very similar pattern with ash at one end of the spectrum and um, oak in the middle of the range of sort of deciduous tree species. So, We've collected together a vast amount of information um, and we really want to make this useful and available. So how have we done this? We've put together the information about all of the oak and ash associated species, um, their conservation status and how they'll use the alternative tree species into um, these databases called ash and oak ecol. And they are available as user-friendly Excel um, files that can be downloaded from these websites. And we very much hope that woodland managers will be able to use these to aid them in their management of their woodlands. And to help with this, we've come up with a five-step approach to um, go through a process to assess the impact of losing either ash or oak in your woodlands and then working out what your management response might be. And very simply, I'll run through these five steps. So firstly, you need to assess what biodiversity is actually on your site. And you can do this using existing species lists or for example, using the um, National Biodiversity Network Gateway and looking at the records there. You then need to work out what species that are present at your site are actually associated with oak or ash and shortlist them. And we've always prioritized species that are either highly associated with ash or oak or partially associated. Obviously, unfortunately, there's nothing we can do for the obligate species. Once we know what species we want to prioritize, we can then identify what alternative tree species might be suitable to for supporting them. And you can do this using our databases. You then need to see if these alternative tree and shrub species are actually present at the site that you're trying to manage. And once you've done this, you've then got the information you need to um, think about how you might manage your site. And there are several options. If the species you want, um, the alternative tree species are, are present at the site, you might be able to increase their abundance through natural regeneration, reducing herbivore abundance, maybe some coppicing and some fencing. If the tree species are not present at the site, then you need to start thinking about whether you want to introduce the, those tree species or not. And obviously that then starts involving some interesting discussions about uh, whether you might want to increase the diversity of your woodland. Sorry, there we go. So you should now be seeing um, two maps, hopefully. And these maps show some case studies where in conjunction with colleagues from Forest Research, we've um, gone through this process for 15 ash woodlands and for 30 oak woodlands, working out how you might manage a site if you wanted to maximize support for biodiversity um, at these sites. Um, and I should stress that was our objective at all of these sites was to maximize the biodiversity supported. Um, and if you're interested in looking at those case studies, they're all available um, to download as PDF documents. Finally, what might happen if we lose both ash and oak, or at least see a decline in both of them in any of our woodlands? 
And as an example of this, I've picked um, four of our case study sites. Um, and these woodlands are oak dominated, but they've also got ash in them. And each of these sites, we found out using data from the NBN, the species present at the sites, and we worked out the number of highly associated oak species present at the site that would also use ash. So at Brittany Common and Monk's Wood, there are eight highly associated oak species that would also use ash, and at Strathville Brake and Totley Wood, there are two. So if we um, saw a decline in oak at these sites, um, we might not be too worried because we know that ash was also present and the species also use ash. However, if we saw ash was declining as well, we might be concerned and wonder what other tree species we could use. And if I could use any of the 29 alternative tree species, this is how many species I could support. So at Brittany Common, I could support four of the eight, and at Monkswood, I could support six of the eight. But that would mean I lost some species potentially, or they at least declined. However, this assumes that I could um, plant any of those 29 alternative tree species that they'd establish, and that was allowable. If I only could use the species present at the site, the tree species already present at the site, then this is the number of species I could support. So if I lost both oak and ash at Brittany Common and at Totley Wood, I wouldn't be able to support either, any of those um, highly associated oak and ash species. Amongst wood, I'd only be able to support one of the eight, and at Strathfield Break, only one of the two of them. So hopefully this illustrates how, um, as we increase the potential the number of tree species lost, we're having an increasing impact on biodiversity. Um, obviously, if we could increase the diversity of the woodland, then we might be able to increase the number of species supported, but that raises the question as to whether that's desirable. So in summary, what I've hopefully shown you this afternoon is that tree diseases have a far wider and broader cascading effect than just an impact on the tree. They're putting many additional species at risk of decline. And while we might be able to mitigate that impact for some species, we can't mitigate that impact for obligates. And whether we can mitigate the impact for other species will depend on whether that tree species, other tree species are present at the site or whether we can establish suitable tree species. I've shown you that whether we, uh, when we assess the suitability of alternative tree species, we need to think both about their similarity in terms of um, functioning and also the biodiversity supported and think about both um, sets of characteristics. We do have a lack of data to assess the suitability of many of our non-native tree species. And finally, um, really wanting to raise the question as to whether we should start thinking about cumulative impact assessments on biodiversity for multiple tree diseases. So thank you all very much. If you want more information, uh, we've tried to summarize this at those two websites. I very much want to thank the team for their hard work on these projects and the funders, and thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Ruth.